So let's take a look at the word break problem. So in this problem, we're given a string, which I've called S, and a list of strings meant to represent a dictionary of possible words. The problem is that we have to decide if we can use any combination of the words from the dictionary to form the string S. We can use the words in the dictionary more than once. So let's take a look at a few examples. This first example here, we would output yes, because we can use fast, race, and car to create the string fast race car. For this example, the output is no, because there's no possible way we can use the dictionary to create the string fast race car. For this example, the answer is yes, because we can use fast, then race, then fast again to create the string fast race fast. Finally, for this last solution, we say yes, because we can use fast, then race car to create the string fast race car. So before we continue to the solutions, I encourage you to pause the video and try this problem for yourself if you haven't already. So the solution to this problem is recursive, and let's take a look at the brute force recursive solution. So here's the overall outline of our algorithm. We want to iterate through the dictionary and check if we can match a word from the dictionary with the beginning of S. For example, we would try and compare Astra to the first five letters of S. If these do not match up, we move on to the next word in the dictionary. If they do match up, then we would splice off the prefix and make a recursive call with the new spliced off word. If we make it through the dictionary without matching up a word with a prefix of S, then we return false for that recursive call. Also, if all the recursive calls we made returned false, we also return false. But if at any time during a for loop, a recursive call returns true, we break out early and return true. And finally, our base case is if an empty string comes. This means we have spliced off perfectly and we should return true. This might be a bit confusing, so let's go through an example. So like I mentioned, we're going to start with Astra and compare it to the first five letters of S. Here they do not match up, so we move on to the next word. Now we compare fast with the first four letters of S. In this case, they do match, so we splice off the matching first four letters and make a recursive call with the remaining part of the string. So as we can see, our recursive call, we have shortened the string with fast spliced off. The dictionary stays the same throughout the whole algorithm. So now we repeat, comparing the first word in the dictionary Astra with the first five letters of the new S. Here they do not match, so we move on to the next word. Fast does not match up with the first four letters of the new S, so we move on to the next word. Here, race does match up with the first four letters of S, so we make a recursive call, splicing off the first four matching letters. So as we can see, car is the remaining S, and now we repeat the process. We start with Astra, and it does not match. Fast does not match. Race does not match. However, car matches, so we splice off the car and make a recursive call with the empty string. This is the base case that we mentioned earlier, so this recursive call returns true. Now we look at our algorithm and see that at any time a recursive call returns true, we can stop the for loop early and just return true. So for this stack call, the same thing happens. We stop looping through the dictionary and just return true. Again, same thing, we stop our for loop and return true. So our overall answer is true. So let's take a look at the real code compared to the outline. Here's the base case. We check if the string is empty by checking if the length is zero. In this base case, we return true. Here's the for loop that goes through every element in the dictionary. I have made a prefix variable and it is used to compare to x, which is the word in our dictionary. I've used Python splicing notation to get the length of x. This just means that if x is a five letter word, prefix will be the first five letters of s. If it is a three letter word, it will be the first three letters of s and so on. We also have a result variable, which is going to be the result of a recursive call in the event we end up making one. And in the first if statement, we compare the prefix to x, and if they are equal, we make a recursive call with the spliced off s and the same dictionary. And if that result is true, we return true. And finally, if we make it to the end of the dictionary without success, we return false. So that was a bit of a drawn out version of the code. Here's a shorter or cleaner version. I'll let you convince yourself that this does in fact do the same thing. Here the time complexity is a little bit complicated. It's exponential, or O of d times 2 raised to the n, where n is the length of the string and d is the size of the dictionary. But there's also a slightly different brute force recursive approach out there. 
it first converts the width to a set. If we first convert the width to a set, it would just be two raised to the n because we would have constant time access to our dictionary uh, to determine if there was a word in the dictionary or not. For space, this is just the maximum size of our recursive stack call. This can be only n elements because in the worst case where we only splice off one letter at a time, we would have n simultaneous stack calls. So now we have gotten the brute force solution out of the way. At this point, you might want to try and pause the video to see if you can improve upon the solution. So the first method we can use to speed things up is memoization. This is commonly known as the top-down approach in these dynamic programming problems. And it's a common way to speed up recursive solutions. I'm going to assume that you guys are somewhat familiar with this technique. However, if you are not, you should still be able to follow along. Whenever there are overlapping subproblems with recursion, this is a common place to use memoization. But first, let's look at how this problem can have potentially overlapping subproblems. So let's trace through the recursive tree with this example using our brute force algorithm we developed earlier. Here we match a, b in the dictionary, so we splice it off. So now the string is c, d, e, f, g, h, and we are able to match c, d, so we splice that off. Now we have the e, f, g, h remaining. There is no combination in the dictionary that can make e, f, g, h. So the answer to this subproblem of e, f, g, h is false. Now we move back up the recursive tree and neither a, b, c, d or h can splice off the subproblem of c, d, e, f, g, h. So the answer to this subproblem is also false. Now moving back up our recursive stack, once again, we try and match c, d, and this is not a match, so we move on to the next word in the dictionary. This is a, b, c, d, which we are able to splice off, so we do so. Our recursive call is then the subproblem e, f, g, h. And what we notice is that we have already solved this subproblem in an earlier recursive call. So now we're doing unnecessary work by processing this recursive call. Therefore, we can see how there is an opportunity for memoization. Our memo should hold the subproblems or strings s, which have already been solved. And our memo should tell whether solving that subproblem in the past resulted in true or false. Thus, our memo is going to be a hash map mapping strings as keys to booleans as values. Now that we have talked about the solution at a higher level, let's convert our brute force approach to take advantage of storing the subproblems. First, we are going to define a helper method, which in addition to the original parameters is going to take in a hash map, or in the case of Python, these are just dictionaries. We then make a call to this helper method from the original word break method passing in the original string, the word list, as well as our hash map, which I've called memo. So now as you see, we make three more changes to our brute force solution. First, we have the recursive call be to the helper method passing along the spliced word, the word list, and this time we pass in the memo as well. We also store the results of our subproblem before returning it in two spots. In the event a recursive call was true, we're going to store true in our memo before returning true. And in the second spot, in the event we make it through the entire dictionary, we're going to store false in our memo and then finally return false. As we can see, this allows us to make use of the memo later for recursive calls in O of one time, rather than having to waste time solving the same subproblem. This leads us to the final step of checking the hash map to see if we have already solved the subproblem. As we can see here, Below our base case, we have added an else if clause that checks if s is in the memo. If it is, it means that we have already solved this problem earlier in the recursive tree, and we can access the same result rather than trying to waste time to solve it a second time. The time complexity of this algorithm is now polynomial with n squared times s, where again, if you convert the dictionary to a set, it's just n squared. The space is still O of n for recursive calls, and the memo will only contain at largest n elements as well. This is because for a string like a, b, c, d, worst case is we subtract off just one letter at a time, and we're storing b, c, d, c, d, and d as subproblems. And since we only can remove one letter at a time, worst case, we're going to store n elements. So now that you have seen the top down approach, let's move on to the bottom up approach. Again, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with dynamic programming, and what a typical bottom-up approach looks like. So for this problem, 
I think it's a good idea to show the code and explain it simultaneously rather than doing them one at a time. I'm going to trace through this situation where the string is A, B, C, D, E, F, and the dictionary is composed of the strings A, B, C, D, and E, F. As I trace through this, I'm going to explain the DP table and why this approach makes sense. So if you're lost right now or get lost halfway through, don't worry, just keep watching and hopefully by the end of the explanation, things will clear up. So let's set up our DP table. It's going to be one longer than the length of the string because each position of the DP table represents the question, can you form the string ending in that position with the words in the dictionary? So we need an extra space to accommodate for the empty string. So if all goes well then, here's what our DP table should look like if our function works correctly. Think of the positions as the answer to the question, can I form the substring ending on this position with my dictionary? So position six represents the question, can I form the string A, B, C, D, E, F with the current dictionary? And we can, we can use A, B, C, D, then E, F to form this, so it should be true. Position five would be false because it represents the question, can I form the string A, B, C, D, E with the current dictionary? And we can't because there's not a combination in our dictionary that will make this. Position four will be true because we can form the string A, B, C, D with A, B, and C, D. Position three is false because we can't form the string A, B, C. And continuing with this logic, we see that position two is true because we can use A, B to form A, B. Position one is false because we can't form the string A, B. And position zero will always be true because we can always form the empty string with any dictionary. We just say we won't select anything from the dictionary. In a sense, it's the empty choice. So as we mentioned, the last position in the array represents the question, can I form the entire string with this dictionary? And this is exactly the overall question of the problem. So this is what we're going to return at the end of our function. Okay, now that we have gotten that out of the way, let's move back to the start of our code. We must manually change the first position to true. This is because as I mentioned earlier, the zero index represents the question, can you form the empty string with this dictionary? The answer is always going to be true and we have to kickstart this algorithm by manually setting this to true. Every other slot in the DP table starts off as false. Now we move into the for loop starting i off at index one. And for each iteration of the outer for loop, we have an inner j for loop, which starts off at i minus one. Here, j is zero and i is one. So let's take a look at the condition, is dpj, which is dp zero, true? Yes, it is. However, a is not in the dictionary. So we're going to leave index one as false. In this algorithm, we're going to repeat this process a bunch of times. So let me explain what these two lines of code are doing. First, i is currently on one. So what sub problem are we trying to answer? We are trying to answer if we can form the string a with our current dictionary. Now let's think of these two lines of code as asking a question as well. The if clause says that if dp of j is true and sj to i is in the dictionary, then we'll mark the position i as true. So what does the dpj mean? Remember, dpj, which is dp0, represents the answer to the question, can we form the string ending at position zero or the empty string with our current dictionary? The answer is yes, so it's true. Now let's look at sj to i in dictionary. What this is asking is, is sj to i in the dictionary? If it is, it means we have it in our dictionary. So this means that if they're both true, we can successfully form the left side, which is the empty string, and the right side, which is a. So thus we can form the combined string, so we'd mark the whole subproblem as true. In this case, sj to i is the same as s0 to 1, which is not in our dictionary, so it fails. So although we can form the left side of the empty string, we cannot form the right side of a. So we move on to the next iteration of the j loop. Since j is equal to zero, we move on to the next iteration of the i loop as well. Here j is one and i is two. Now when i is two, for this iteration of the for loop, we are trying to answer the sub problem. Can we form a b with the current elements in the dictionary? So again, let's look at the if statement. Is dp of j, which is dp of one, true? No, it isn't. It means we can't form the left side, which represents a. At this point, we can move on, but let's just take a look at the right side for completion. sj to i 
is S1 to 2, which is B. B is not in the dictionary. This means that even if we had the elements necessary to form the left side of A, since B is not in the dictionary, we can't complete the right side of B. Now J moves to the left to 0. Here DPJ is DP0, which is true because it is the answer to the question, can we form the empty string? This empty string is the left side, so now let's see if we can complete the right side. The right side is S of 0 to 2, which is AB. Is AB in our dictionary? Yes, it is. So as we can see, since DP of J is true, we can form the left side. And since the right side of AB is in the dictionary, we can form the right side. So this means we can combine these two to solve the I equals 2 subproblem of AB. So now we mark the I equals 2 slot in the array to true. Okay, since j is now at 0, we move on to the next iteration of i. Here, i is 3, so for this iteration of the i for loop, we're going to answer the question, can we form the string abc? The left side, which is dp of 2, is true. Remember, this means we can form the left side of ab, and this is true because we can use ab from the dictionary to form the string ab. The right side is s of 2 to 3, which is c. c is not in the dictionary, so we move on. Notice that if we happen to have C in our dictionary, I equals three would be true because we would be able to use AB to form the left side and C to form the right side. But we don't have C in our dictionary, so we move J to the left to index one. Here DP1 is false, meaning we can't form an A. So we can just stop and move on. However, for completion, the right side of S1 to three is BC and BC is not in the dictionary either. So even if we could form the left side, we couldn't make the right side anyways. Either way, let's move on to j equals zero. Here, dp of j is true because we can form the empty string. The right side, s zero to three is abc, and this is not in the dictionary, which means we can't complete the right side. j is zero here, so we're done with this iteration of i equals three of the for loop, and this slot will remain false, and rightly so because we can't form the string abc with this current dictionary, no matter what combination of words we use. Now for i equals four, for this iteration, we're trying to answer if we can form the string a, b, c, d with this dictionary. For j equals three, dp of three is false, meaning we can't form the left side of a, b, c. We can move on, but for completion, we wouldn't be able to form the right side of d either. Here j is two, so dp of j is true. This is because we are able to form the left side of a, b. Now the right side is S2 to 4, which is CD. CD is also in the dictionary, so this means we can form the left side and the right side. Thus we mark I equals 4 as true. And note at this point, we can actually just skip the rest of the J loop because we are not going to be changing the I equals 4 slot to false regardless of what happens for J equals 1 and J equals 0. Therefore, let me add a break statement into our algorithm so we can skip to the I equals 5 iteration of the for loop. At this point, I hope you're getting a better feel for what this DP approach does, so I'm going to move through the next iterations quickly. Here the left side is A, B, C, D, and the right side is E. Although the left side is true, which means we can form it, we can't complete the right side with an element from our dictionary, so we move on. Here the left side is A, B, C, and the right side is D, E, and we can form neither of these, so we move on. Here the left side is A, B, and although we can form A, B, we can't complete the right side of C, D, E, so we move on. Here the left side is A, and the right side is B, C, D, E. We can form neither, so we move on. Here the left side is the empty string, and although we can form the empty string, we can't complete the right side of A, B, C, D, E, so we move on. Since J is zero, we're done with this iteration of I, and move on to I equals six. So the I equals five slot will remain false, and rightly so, because we can't form A, B, C, D, E, with any combination from our dictionary. Here we cannot form the left side of A, B, C, D, E, so we move on. Here we can form the left side of A, B, C, D, and in addition, we can complete the right side of E, F because E, F is in our dictionary. Thus, we mark this position as true, and we break exiting the J loop. Since we are also on the last iteration of the I loop, we exit out of that as well. And finally, DP of length of S is returned which is true, and this is the correct answer. The time complexity of this algorithm is n squared because we have the inner and the outer for loop, and we use n extra space in our DP table, so the space complexity is n. So, so those are the three solutions for this word break problem. 
In particular, this last solution is a bit tricky, so if you have any extra questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. But that's it for now. I hope this video helped and thank you for watching.